uh, Amanda, um, you should be able to uh, steer the ship when you're when you're ready. Um, and I will. I know that I have to drop something in the chat for everybody. Can um, you make it so that I can have video? I'm one of those wave my hands around people. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, you should be able to 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 share your screen and, and it should you should have full access to you should be able to turn your video on. Now I can. Yay. There you go. Okay, okay. super awesome. Super. All right, and I'm going to drop the link into the chat that you sent to me. I will do that. And cool. and I realized 10 seconds ago that I had missed one, so I'll finish populating that last one after I am done. Okay. So, Great. we are Thank going you. to share this whole desktop. It's going to be exciting. Live demos are always exciting. I know. I'm super excited. Okay. Right. So, I uh, hi uh, I'm going to be talking about operationalizing FAIR at the Common Fund Data Ecosystem. And so um, you're going to have to see me for the next 30 minutes or so. So this is who I am uh, when I'm like actually visible. I'm in a very dark room right now. But uh, I did my bachelor's degree. I have a bachelor's in criminal justice and another one in biochemistry. After I finished my bachelor's, I spent a while working as a landscape entomologist. And then I spent several years building experimental tank armor out of ceramics and doing experimental plasma chemistry to try to make plastics act like glass. Um, after that, I spent several years doing large scale mass spectrometry screens um, and large scale genetic screens to try to classify all of the mutations in this model organism plant. Um, and then I started my PhD and my PhD is in population genetics. So it's in a lot of like statistics and comparative genomics types things. And throughout that entire time, I was also doing tons and tons of teaching. So I have taught at basically every grade level from kindergarten all the way through uh, like to graduate students. I've taught like a, a bizarre variety of topics from chemistry to bioinformatics to biology, uh, histology, all sorts of things. And I've taught to multiple different species from multiple different um, King, or not kingdoms, I guess, but birds, mammals. I used to work at a zoo and I was the trainer. So I've taught almost anything that you can imagine. Um, and that really eclectic background is bizarrely compatible with my current job, which is working to manage the common fund data ecosystem, which is this common fund uh, initiative, initiative to increase the uptake reusability of uh, common fund data sets and tools and to basically increase fairness across the common fund. And don't worry, I am going to explain further how these two are connected. So the NIH, um, as Laura was just telling you, is made up a bunch of institutes. There, there's 27 institutes and centers, at least there was last time I checked. Um, and each one of them has a pretty specific research agenda. They mostly focus on one disease or on one body, body system. So there's the National Eye Institute, they do eye stuff. There's the Genome Research Center, they do genome stuff. Um, Institute of Aging works on aging related things. And so there's all of these, pro all of these big ICs, this is the kind of data they fund. But in the early 2000s, people started to realize that there's, there's really interesting cross-cutting questions that, that don't fit in any of these buckets. So if I wanted to do genomic research on eyes, it's not clear to me as a researcher who I ask for money. And it wasn't clear to the ICs who should be funding it. So there was all of this interesting research that, that was not really getting done because we couldn't figure out how to fund it just at sort of a NIH level. So the solution to that was that in 2006, Congress passed an act to create the Common Fund. And it was called the Common Fund because it was literally taking a percentage of the funding from each of those ICs, dumping it into a big bucket in the middle and using it to fund these projects that wouldn't otherwise be funded because they were cutting across the missions of multiple ICs. So they were meant to fund these transformative projects that were gonna be uh, about 
these kind the, the kind of cross-cutting initiatives that wouldn't otherwise have happened. And so there's been lots and lots of these funded. Um, there's lots more than I have on this screen, but this is just a sampling of them. And the one I'm gonna point out to you is the HMP, which is the Human Microbiome Project, because that's the one pretty much everyone has heard of the Human Microbiome Project. Um, but each one of these is just as big and just as complicated and just as cool of a project, even if it's not one that you've necessarily heard of. They're, they're working on all of these really neat things. Um, but because of the way that these projects were set up, they are transformative, they're cross-cutting, they're unique. This is the literal criteria for that Common Fund uses to decide whether they're going to fund something. And so since all of these entities are unique and transformative and cross-cutting, there wasn't stuff already for them to use to build these programs. They, each one of them built their own data models. They figured out their own infrastructure. They have designed their own research programs that each individual one is cross-cutting the microbiome cross cuts between genomics and gut health. And, and that's really cool, but you can't take the HMP data and combine it with the GTEx data because they each built these individual programs that, that are in themselves innovative and cross cutting, but aren't, interact, aren't interoperable with each other. So Common Fund has all of these big cool programs, but none of the data actually goes together. So, uh, oh, and, and each of these programs does wildly different things. So HMP does genomics, uh, Lynx does uh, mostly cell lines, but does a lot of like um, metabolomic studies. The metabolomics workbench obviously is mostly metabolomics. GTEx has RNA-seq. 4D Nucleome is doing this cool thing where they're trying to map what is inside of all of the different cell types. Um, and build like a physical map, but over time, that's the fourth D. And so they have not only wildly different models and different infrastructures, but they have lots of different data types. Like there's all of these different things and Common Fund wanted to find a way to bring them together. And so just like my eclectic history, the Common Fund data ecosystem is trying to take all of these eclectic programs and to make them more fair so that you can interrupt, operate between them so that people can find them more easily and reuse them and do all of this cool stuff that everyone wants to do. So if I had like four hours, I could talk forever about all of the different ways that we're trying to improve the fairness of stuff at the common fund data ecosystem at, for common fund data sets at the common fund data ecosystem. Um, there's there's all sorts of weird things that have happened, but since we're in a 30 minute talk today, the one that I'm going to focus on is increasing data reuse and increasing interoperability of existing common fund data sets and future data sets. So, since we're talking about data reuse and interoperability, we should talk about how one might combine data. So you could imagine two different ways. There's probably other ways, but these are the two we're gonna talk about right now. So the first one I personally call munging. Um, these aren't technical words. These are words I made up for the purposes of this talk. So you could imagine that you have an RNA-seq project and you did a bunch of, uh, bunch of very specific things to test these two cells. Now you have a differential expression analysis. You could find another data set that's very much like yours, right? It has the same cells, they did the same pipeline, they did all these different things. You could mash them together and have one even bigger data set. If you have sufficient uh, um, metadata about these and the metadata is similar enough, it just jam all together. Now they're one big thing and you have more statistical power. Maybe you can find subtler phenotypes. You can do more cooler science just because your data set is suddenly bigger. That's really hard though, because it relies on those data sets being similar enough that you can jam them together and still have a scientifically valid op, uh, like thing come out of it. So the other way that you could think about combining data 
if you were, for instance, someone that had worked on basically every version of science that exists, is this thing that I called layering. So what if I have this RNA-seq data and it's about these two different cell types? And then I could also go and find a metabolomic screen of those two different cells. And I could layer those two on top of each other and have more information about both. And they're sort of in different dimensions. And then I could imagine going and finding histology about those cells and being able to see how they physically interact. And that would add more information to my, my cake here of layered data. And maybe then I could also find someone that did a GWAS and one of the, the, the genes that I identified in my differential expression also came up in this GWAS. And I could imagine stacking all of these different kinds of data on top of each other. And it wouldn't matter as much that they all have different protocols because they're all completely different things. They're, the thing that they have in common is that they're all the same tissue or they're all the same cell or they're all the same whatever my thing of interest is. And that's a little bit easier problem. So when we, uh, when we went to start this project, one of the first things that we decided we needed to do was say, okay, we have all of these different programs. Is there stuff that actually overlaps because they, are, they have all of this different stuff in them? We know that they're doing wildly different things. Is there anything overlapping there? And so I built this uh, website, which is one of the links that should be in that link list that I gave you. And there's a whole bunch of buttons and I'm not gonna show you most of them because it's, it's fun to play with, but there's a lot here. So what this does is I have all of, I have a bunch of the different programs listed here and I have behind the scenes gone through and looked through the metadata they have available at their respective websites. And I've built a huge table of whether they have a given piece of metadata or not. And then I've put it into this program, which is essentially like a really fancy Venn diagram. So it lets me simultaneously build every Venn diagram for every uh, dimension of this huge thing. So any set of uh, uh, programs together and the particular facet I'm showing you right now is about anatomy. So in this first one, if I was going to look at GTEx and COMP, which are two of these programs, they, those two have exactly one anatomy term in common that I found. They both have data about the esophagus. If I go down here for GTEx and LINX and COMP and IDG, they have five data type anatomy terms in common. So in theory, if I was interested in breast tissue or stomach or testes or thyroid or uterus, I could go to these four different uh, programs and find data about those tissues. And since I know that GTEx is all RNA-seq in um, humans, I know that COMP is all mutant screens in mice. I know that IDG and Lynx are both um, cell lines, but they do, since they're cell lines, they do lots of different assays. So just for, for these five tissues, I might be able to find my RNA-seq and my metabolomics and a mutant screen and all of those things that I can sort of stack on top of each other and actually get a cool bit of data out of. So in theory, this should work. So um, the other thing that I did switching back and forth a lot, is I took that same information, and this is a really ugly plot, I apologize, but there's just so much data that it wasn't easy to make pretty. So this black part is that same anatomy. Oh no, I don't have a cursor. Oh no. I'm gonna do it this way. Do do. Because I can beat the system. There we go. So this black part here is all of those same anatomy terms, like uh, the anatomy terms are here. So HMP and 40 nucleome and SPARC and COMP and IDG and GTEx, whatever anatomy term this is, they all share this one, right? And so you can go across here and look at all the anatomy. 
But up here, I've sort of overplotted other things that you might care about. So is the, the information they have about disease or about healthy specimens? So you can see that xRNA and metabolomics and links and GTEx and IDG, all of these have information about healthy individuals. Some of them also have disease individuals. There's metabolomic data at some sites. There's binding data. There's epigenomic data. There's gross imaging. There's all of these different kinds of data. And there's overlap among all of those too. So we should be able to do something really cool here. Let me go back to play. Awesome. So in theory, we should be able to take data from these things and, and make something that is actually usable for an end researcher to, to build a cool data set. So let's get started. We're gonna do FAIR and we're gonna do it in four easy steps. So step one, is we went to these programs. Like I said, I built that admittedly super ugly graph by um, going to each of their websites and pulling out what data I could find, but in a very naive way, right? Because I don't have access to their underlying data when I do that. So what we did is we physically went back in the before times when you could leave your house and go to rooms where other people were also in. And we physically went to these programs and we interviewed them for two days about all of their data. What kind of data do you have? How do you store it? What metadata models do you use? All of these different things. And we recorded all of that about a bunch of the programs so that we had some baseline information about what kinds of, of interactions we could expect to have. Then we built a big cool model. And our big cool model is called the C2M2. And there's links to the documentation for that and a bunch of stuff about it, again, in that um, links list that I've circulated. So we've built this model. And the idea is that if each of these programs took their data that they have internally and translated it into our model, where we have built this specific way of describing it, then, then we'll have a model that holds all of their data, but in the same, all of the metadata about their data, but in, in one, one way so that you could actually search across it and find those intersections instead of doing what I did, which was go to this website and decide if, well, what kind of tissue is this and try to manually do it, which takes a ton of time. Obviously, if you've got this model and you've got everybody putting their data into this model so that you can so that you can search it, you want to be able to search it. So step three is we built a portal to host all of this modeled metadata. And it lets you come as an end user and search that modeled metadata and be able to find like, oh, this, these, these four programs all have this kind of data. That's really cool. Let me go and get that data. So those are the steps. Now everything's fair. It's going to be great. So uh, before I show you our portal, which I'm going to do, I'm very excited about it. We released it yesterday at 6 p.m. my time. So we're gonna do a live demo. Um, but before I show it to you, I'm gonna show you a little bit more about the model. So these are snippets of those boxes, um, just to give you the idea, an idea of what our model is, what are the information that goes into our model. And I'm comparing it here to the FAIR guiding principles that were in the original FAIR paper um, that uh, we've all at least said that we have read. Uh, so the, um, we have lots of ways that we're allowing people to model their data. This one I'm showing you here is BioSample. And you can see we have a persistent ID. We're using URIs. So that is uh, A1 metadata retrievable by some identifier using a standard communications protocol. We can get URIs for all of their bio samples, accessibility. Um, we're trying to make that happen. We are recording things like anatomy. And for the anatomy terms for those tissues, we don't want everyone to put in whatever word they're using, we want to give them a controlled vocabulary to use. So this is part of I, um, I2, right? You want metadata that uses vocabularies that fair, follow FAIR principles, and you want everyone to use 
I1 metadata in a formal, accessible, broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. So for every term um, across our model that, um, that we could, we found a controlled vocabulary that is in wide use and had everyone conform their data to, to that vocabulary. So for anatomy, we're using Uberon. And we did the same things for several different types of assets that these programs might have. So they have things like biosamples, they have things like files, right? A lot of, if you have information about RNA-seq, that's going to come in the form of a file. So again, this is a collapsed version of our file table, but just to give you an idea of what's in there, we have all sorts of IDs. We have that URI again, we have MD5 so that you can find the data and make sure that you have the right data. Um, and then again, for things like file format, for data type, for assay type, for MIME type, each one of those has a specific ontology, a specific controlled vocabulary that is in wide use that we pulled and we're having everyone conform their data to that controlled vocabulary. All right, it's demo time, I'm excited. So, um, like I said, our portal went live yesterday, uh, not quite, or uh, like 16 hours ago. So I want to show you what happens when you ask all of these different programs to put their data into this structured model so that you can increase fairness. So this is our portal. If you have the links open, you can go here too. Uh, we have uh, what I'm going to call, because I work here and it's in my best interest, an impressive amount of data. We have uh, over 6,000 subjects, represented 425,000 biosamples. We have almost 600,000 files in here. Um, and they're, uh, show they're, those are representing uh, 986 projects, data sets, clumps of, clumps of data. And you can see that right now, not all of the programs I showed you are participating. We obviously started with a smaller set and we're going to grow, but we have different amounts of data from each of these programs. And if you go to the website, uh, you can do cool things like look and see uh, how much data we have by different um, parameters. You don't have to look by program. You can do data type by sample count, all sorts of all sorts of ways of slicing the data so that you can see what is actually here in this um, website. So let's look at the files that we have available. So our database basically gives you a big list of all of the files and then lots and lots of ways to filter that data down into something that you might use. So we have all of these different topics that you can filter on and then within those you can choose all sorts of different things. And there's also this search feature so that you can just type in a search term that's of interest to you if that's easier. So here's what I found really interesting uh, looking through this data as we started to get it. We had all of these programs take a structured data model. We gave them controlled vocabulary that they needed to use to, um, to describe their data. And I've already shown you that I could go through their websites and I could, I could find things that overlap. But if I actually choose any of these things, including any of the ones that I already showed you that I know have overlapping data, what we find is that is that I have to wait for this to load. There we go. Is that um, there's an awful lot of Uberon anatomy terms, and they have lots and lots and lots of specificity. So if I go and choose any of the anatomy terms that I know there actually is data that should be represented at all of these programs, what I find is that I don't get the cool cross-cutting thing that I was expecting. And I don't get it because when we have experts describe their data that they have deeply intimate knowledge of in this model, 
they choose very, very specific ways to describe that data. And so, although I said, okay, if something is, um, you have to do, I would say if that blood is the anatomy term, then, but, the, but there's five or six different Uberon anatomy terms for blood. You can have blood, you can have venous blood, you can have capillary blood, you can have arterial blood. And what happened is that everyone that had blood chose a different way to describe it. So I would clump them all together, but the people that own this data and know everything about it didn't lump them together. And this is true across all of the different facets. So I can choose RNA-seq assay. And again, I know that RNA-seq data exists at all of these different places. But again, I only get one program when I search RNA-seq assay because they've all described their, their assays in slightly different ways. Um, I'm going to show you another one, which I like because I think it is really good at describing the sort of issue that we face when we're trying to do interoperability across data sets. So fluorescence imaging is an assay type where you take usually a histological sample, you do some stuff to it so that some of the cells glow and some of the cells don't glow, and then you take a picture of it. And that whatever um, the, the glowing thing is attached to is usually attached to some kind of mutation or some kind of uh, uh, thing that you've done to the cell. You're trying to see if, if what you did worked. So maybe you've attached to a drug and you're trying to see where the drug went. Maybe you've attached it so that it'll make certain parts of certain proteins light up. And all of those are fluorescence imaging. But everyone has a very specific way that they describe their fluorescence imaging. And that makes sense because they have spent years and years building this big impressive data set from the ground up. And they did a very, very specific thing. So where I, as an end user think, oh, this is all fluorescence. The people that, that made this data know that it's actually a fluorescence imaging cell-based cell proliferation assay. And those distinctions are important for the people that made the data. And I just think that this is really interesting because the thing that it underlies is that, yes, building technology is super important. It's super important that we have big databases. It's super important that we build the infrastructure to allow people to, um, to do searches, to do logins without having to try, or without having to log into a hundred different things. It's really important that we have uh, technologies that do stuff. The technology is super important, but the technology alone isn't what's going to make the data fair. The people are what is gonna make the data fair. We, what we really need, we have the technology, we have this cool database. We have structured tech, structured ways for them to describe their data, but that's not enough. That doesn't that doesn't magically give the end user the ability to search and find these cross cutting data sets that we're looking for. What we need is to get everyone to agree on granularity. We need everyone to agree that just calling these things is fluorescence is okay, or to agree that no, these, there's, there needs to be two fluorescence assays split because the, there's a very important difference here. We all agree on that, but we're gonna take those six and collapse them down to two. Um, it's a really big people problem. It's more a people problem than it is a technology problem. So the thing that we're doing at the Common Fund Data Ecosystem now, and we have been doing this for a while, the fact that people are the important thing isn't brand new news. I was just weirdly excited to see just how obvious having our new technology made the importance of people um, more obvious. But what we do 
is we've started this cross-pollination campaign. And we basically hold meetings all of the time, at least once a month, to try to bring together these different programs, bring together the people that work at these different programs, have them talk to one another about these kinds of issues. Because what we really need is a community of practice. We need a community of people that all agree on what these terms mean and how we're going to use an ontology. Because having just having an ontology isn't enough to make the data fair. So we have lots of cross-pollination meetings where we, we have lots of working groups where we're actively trying to solve these kinds of problems. And we invite people from um, all over to come to the cross-pollination meetings if that's a thing that interests you. So um, in, again, my big links list that I circulated at the beginning, um, I will finish filling in the link to our help desk. So if anyone is interested in joining our cross-pollination meetings and coming and, and uh, hearing what we talk about, uh, you would be welcome to do that. And speaking of people and how important people are, I am now going to show you the obligatory, these are all of the people that work on the Common Fund Data Ecosystem. Um, these are the PIs, this is not everyone, uh, but we have a big diverse group. So the Common Fund Data Ecosystem Coordinating Center, so the people that are coordinating all of this are these um, seven uh, PIs from across the US and Europe. All of them have uh, lots of people that work for them. And so they're, we're a group of about 70 people now, um, not including all of the programs that we're partnering with that uh, submit all of their data for us to share. So I hope that was at least mildly informative and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, Natalie, you're able to unmute yourself. I know that you've got a you've got a question uh, in the chat, so feel free to unmute yourself. If others have questions uh, from our our guests, please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A, and I will uh, I'll be able to read those. Um, uh, and then I've got a couple of questions if we have time as well. So, Natalie, Amanda, this was really great to see. Thank you so much. Um, how fun to see it on almost its first day alive. I wondered if you have time to show us how you got the anatomy facet to appear. I noticed that if I entered via browse by subject, I couldn't seem to get the anatomy facet. And I had a follow on question. Are there any terms in the taxonomy facet beside homo sapiens? And if so, how do we query the data using that part of the taxonomy? Um, yes, so I can do all of that. So each one of these uh, view data by gives you, uh, so I showed you there was all of those tables, right? And so they're all interconnected. It's a database graph, but uh, these let you enter from like different sides of it. So if you search by all files, what the search facets that you get are the ones that were in that, in that big um, picture of, of the model it gives you the facets that are directly connected to that table. So if you start from biosample, you get the facets that are directly connected to that table and you can sort of walk your way around, but the facets are different depending on what point you start at. So you were at biosample, you said? I came in through browse by subject. By subject. And yeah. I was just, I don't want to belabor or use up your time on this, oh, detail, no, it's, but it's it was good. something I was curious about because I noticed yeah. the facets were different, but I couldn't figure out how or why. So this is awesome. Yep. Yeah. So it's just because you're you're basically coming at a cube from different sides. And so you can see different different edges. Um, so if you don't have any filters on, we right now we only have data from humans and mice. So uh, those are the those are the options at the moment. As more data is put in, that should expand because we do have uh, a couple other species. Like there will be at least rats. Um, most of the common fund programs do focus on humans, um, but there are some mouse studies and some rat studies. There might be a couple of others, but it's going to be it's going to be real human focused. Um, like I said, because you're coming in from this 
angle at the model, you don't have an anatomy table. But if you search by, that is not how spelling works at all. Um, if you search for an anatomy term, the, the search box can like go and find the right path to actually give you the search, those search results, if that makes any sense. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, and one other cool thing is, so if you click on any one of these little view tables, um, you can go and see all of the things that are associated with it. So one thing that I think is cool, there's other ways to sort of enter this data set. So if you go to vocabulary and anatomy and you do that same thing, you ask for, oh, well, let's, let's pick one of these. Let's look at sigmoid colon just for, because it was the one on top. Um, so this tells you the anatomy, the sigmoid colon, but it'll also tell you about every biosample and every file. And if there was subjects, it would show you all of those. Um, it by default collapses out the empty um, ones. But if you go to a term that you're interested in, and this works for like, if you put in RNA seq or something, um, you can go to this sort of table that collapses everything all into one big view. Uh, and I have completely forgotten your other question. Oh, that's really cool. Thanks. I think Melissa had a question too. So um, okay. I'll um, return to you later if there's time. Sure. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to, since we're at two minutes to the hour and I know people have meetings coming up, um, I actually would like to, instead of answering, asking my question, I'll follow up with everybody. Um, thanks, Natalie. And thank you both. Those uh, presentations were so wonderful and we're very excited uh, to have you here. I want to uh, make a couple of announcements about upcoming activities that we'll be having uh, shortly. So uh, April 31st, uh, is the first meeting uh, of the Fair Data Stewards Interest Group. Um, I will I will drop uh, I'll drop a link in here uh, for everybody. So uh, people are welcome to join that that meeting. Uh, I believe you can sign up at the link I just dropped. Um, there will be a session uh, in uh, that's planned for June uh, on fair workflows. Uh, including the Workflows Hub and Doc Store, and details will go out about that on Twitter or email within the next couple of weeks. And finally, um, Laura Biven will be coming back soon to talk with us and present findings from a very recent workshop, Pioneering the Future of Federally Supported Data Repositories, uh, and we'll be excited to have that, and I'll follow up. Laura will set a date. Uh, very good. All right. So uh, it was so nice to have you both here, I think, for the biomedical community um, and, and for all of us who work in, in other or related fields, being able to see what's happening there on the leading edge is fantastic. And so really appreciate uh, your, your, your thoughtful presentations and all your time today. Um, for folks, our guest attendees, feel free to follow up with us anytime uh, via email or on, on Twitter or via our website and uh, let us know if we can be of any assistance or you'd like additional topics uh, presented here uh, in our Fair on the Ground series. All right, thanks very much.